Welcome to the Alderley Park Discovery Podcast, produced in partnership with the online pharmaceutical news and analysis destination PharmaForum. The podcast presents perspectives on UK and global bioscience innovation trends, with input from experts located within Alderley Park in the northwest of England. The Life Science Campus offers exceptional bioscience facilities for R&D focused life science companies at every stage of their life cycle, from startup to global corporate. I'm Dominic Tyre, Creative and Editorial Director at PharmaForum. In episode three of the podcast, we're going to be talking about successfully accessing the life science funding and investment. My first guests are Claire Brown, Investment Director at BioCity, and Jane Theaker, who's CEO at Kinomica. They're followed by Lisa Anson, CEO at RedX Pharma. And then we have Dr. Kath Mackay, who's Managing Director for Bruntwood Cytex Alderley Park. So Claire, if I may start with you, can you tell me a bit about uh, what the current state of UK life science funding looks like? Yeah, of course. So I think from my perspective, what we've seen, I guess, over the past few years, and of course, in, in recognition of what COVID's done, is actually, I think we've got quite a buoyant UK life science funding pot. There is a variety of new players started to come into the investment market. And so for some of these early stage life science companies, increasingly at the very, very creation stage, you're starting to see the importance of of groups such as friends and family rounds, angel investors, crowdfunding, um, and then, you know, starting to bring in some of the um, EIS type funds. So traditionally, they weren't really that exposed in the life science sector because of the capital needed for these type of companies, but increasingly they're becoming quite an important point. And then I think as you move towards, you know, larger amounts of capital needed for companies, you know, the large VCs, the institutional VCs and the corporate VCs that uh, look to fund early stage innovation, I actually think they've not really been impacted too much recently. Um, They have long range objectives. They look to invest in things that will be going on the market in eight, 10 years from now. So I think they take a much longer view. They're quite resilient about things that are happening at a macro level and um, and, and really just wanting to, to get a, a strong position in those companies to, to really they, they sort of make a decision to invest in them at the beginning and then ideally follow them all the way through. So I'd say from a UK perspective that the funding market is pretty good. But increasingly, we're starting to see a lot more of US type funds and broader European funds wanting to invest in the UK because they recognise the um, expertise of our, um, you know, well, the, well, the teams, you know, the management that, that's in the UK, but also the academic, the quality of the academic science. And so increasingly, you start to see influx of money from, from non-UK sources. And I think that's a really good balance because it gives different sources of capital, capital, but also gives different scale as well, because clearly, you know, the US is one of the, the largest markets for capital. But then I think we, we can't ignore that in the UK, the non-dilutive sources of funding has been, you know, paramount to a lot of companies' success. And I know we'll hear in the same podcast from Kynomica and how they were able to leverage an, an early U, Innovate UK uh, grant. But but that is very important initiatives such as Innovate UK, Biomedical Catalyst, you know, all of those type of funding, the Future Fund, we'll go into that in a wee minute, but they're also been so important to leverage the private capital and make that money go a wee bit further. And I think they have been instrumental. And we're very lucky in the UK because a lot of countries don't have the capability and the investment from the governments that the UK has. So I do think when we look at that component, we are we are actually in a really good shape. And you know, I, I definitely see the Future Fund has really changed the shape of a lot of companies that probably would have wouldn't have survived over the past few years. And I don't think that's because the science wasn't good enough or the proposition wasn't good enough. I just think simply they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And increasingly investors were wanting to go into the keep stay in the, the kind of public markets because they were showing such good returns, which meant there was started to 
to see this slight imbalance with the with the kind of private market. So I do think that the future funds had a, a huge amount to play there, and um, and I know that can make a huge difference to a company's success. And, and Jane, from from your perspective, so we've heard it's quite a buoyant funding pot out there. But from your perspective, um, how how easy do you think it is to attract life science funding? Well, I think it very much depends on your investment proposition, um, and there are certain boxes you have to tick to secure investment. Uh, and those boxes basically relate to de-risking your proposal and reducing the work that you're asking investors to do to understand that proposal, really. And the issue is that it's not always obvious what those boxes are that you've got to tick as a company seeking investment. Um, so to make that process a lot easier, I received some fantastic pitch deck training from the KTN, the Knowledge Transfer Network, and that's that's government funded, and um, Ned Wakeman at Aldley Park, who runs the Accelerator at Aldley Park. Uh, and that really helped us to secure the investment um, at Series A. But we also got some help at, at, uh, at Seed as well from Claire and her team at Aldley Park. Um, but you really do have to meet an awful lot of investors or uh, kiss a lot of frogs in the parlance to find the investor who has a hole in their portfolio that's just shaped for, for your company. And, and Claire, can you tell us a bit about what uh, perhaps other types of um, startup or scale up support uh, early stage and uh, growing uh, life science businesses might need? Yeah, and I think this is quite a, a key um thing for companies so i think one well in the uk in particular and i know you know all the parks a great example of this but with the accelerators that are are run broadly across the uk these i think are really really incredibly helpful for early stage companies just coming off the starting blocks it's you know you might you might have a great idea you might be an academic you might be an entrepreneur but actually that idea is just the beginning uh, you have to start to put all the bits and bobs around it. And often people don't know what they don't know. And so the accelerators can kind of give you a format to follow. So if you're naturally a scientist, you tend to be a wee bit analytical anyway. And so it's actually quite good to have a framework to work around. And that's what, what we try and do in our accelerators that, that the BioCity run. But um, definitely the, the accelerators I've been involved in across the UK, it's very important. And then also it's been able to leverage mentors because there's an incredible amount of people that have been there, done that, been successful, that are willing to give their time. And so for an early stage company, if you're able to leverage that mentor network and leverage those people that are willing to give their time for free, then you'd be crazy not to because they, they will be fundamental in helping you understand when is the right time to hire particular people what are the right people you want to have in the very beginning and not make that mistake of having a, you know, a huge team, frankly, that the business isn't quite ready to sustain. So you really need to understand your budget at that very early stage. You really need to make sure you're spending the money on the right things and not putting an infrastructure that's a bit premature. You need to make sure you get the right bodies in the, 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 the business. And that will be very different from the growth stage. Um, and then I think, you know, one of the other things is how you position and how you tell your story, because you might have the best technology in the world, but if you can't communicate it in a way that people understand, and so the pitch preparation that a lot of accelerators offer uh, and mentors can advise on as well, is quite important to make sure your story's been told in the right way. When you move over into more of a later stage of business, your, your needs change. Um, there's a number of you know, lawyers and, and accountancy firms have got these startup packages, which are fantastic to get you out the starting blocks. Once you get to a stage where you're, you're in growth, it brings different challenges. You maybe need to expand your C-suite team and it becomes more around, you know, strategy. There's also, you've probably got an investor on board at that point and, you know, you're having to deliver to what that investor wants to see as well. And so that means a, a certain professionalization of your business. So what you might have got away with when you're, you know, a semi-academic group just st starting out doesn't quite work when you're starting to generate large amounts of money and, and work with investors that are looking to seek returns and they've got a very defined plan to follow. So I do think that 
you need to hire at the right time. You need to get the processes in place to make you a bit more efficient. And that means um, both from a financial perspective, a sort of rigour that might, you may not have applied at the beginning, but the process will make you more efficient. You know, there's this fallacy that as you get bigger, you become less efficient. I don't think that's the case. I think what it is, is you actually get the processes that are necessary to help you grow. And so putting that that in place is key. But that's when you start to build a board that will provide some of that support and that guidance, again, from people that have maybe been there, done that. You know, you might have the most novel technology in the world, but fundamentals of business don't really change. And so having the right non-exec advisors around about you is key. And that is something that you need to start thinking about at the early stage, but definitely making sure you, you have those guys in place. And essentially, your team's got bigger. So you've got to start to think about how you look after your staff, um, how you take your staff on the journey because you're growing. And that can be very difficult for people that are entrepreneurial in nature to recognise that the stakes are slightly different when you've raised, say, a couple of million into your business. So I would say that... Um, you know, throughout the whole, whether you're early stage or late stage, how you communicate your business is paramount. But again, you might see the messages starting to change a bit when you are a bit bigger and you are going for that next level up of development or that next level up of funding. You really need to make sure your, your messaging is correct in, in the outside world. And whether you bring that formally into the company and hire somebody that, that's your kind of... Um, you know, you're kind of marketing people or you choosing the right partners to work with to deliver it. You don't have to have everybody in house. You can have work with external parties to do it, but you need guidance on how to work out the right ones and who's good to work with and who will be a good fit for you as a business. And I think a lot of that comes from just asking anybody you can um, that, that's done, seen this and done this before for 15 minutes of their time to help support you and give you some pointers is, is incredibly valuable, I think. And Jane, building on that, thinking about um, that need to find and interact with, with the right people, how do you go about building up the connections and network that's needed for that and also for, for raising funding? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I would say use every single contact you have. Um, so I, I went to the um, kind of my home base, if you like. I went to my chair first and got a, a list of life sciences investors from her um, because she happened to have a banking background. And that was also coming out of uh, the, the input that Claire had given to the company initially in, in getting her involved in the company. So that was a jolly useful person to have in our batting for our side, as it were. Um, I also went to um, investment showcases run by the Knowledge Transfer Network. Um, I used BioSeed and went to a BioSeed investment showcase run by OBN. Um, and that gave us an opportunity to showcase the, the company and tell our story. Um, and we also went to BioNow networking events. So these are industry um, uh, lobby groups, if you like, um, or the voice of the industry, if you like. Um, I also asked other CEOs who, who they'd used to raise money and asked for introductions. I used um, BioCap, that's run at Oldley Park as well, um, a, a sort of network of uh, people who are willing to invest and wanting to invest in the life sciences industry. Um, I used the internet, used Google. Um, I used Claire, Claire Brown's Little Black Book um, for introductions and personal introductions. I think in short, I would have asked the neighbourhood cat for contacts if I thought it would be a productive conversation. But but what you have to realise is that when a company, uh, when you interact with an investor and they maybe turn you down, it doesn't mean that they don't like you. It's just that the timing not, might not be right or the, the amount you're asking for isn't what quite right or they have a different mix of companies and different risk profiles that they have in their investment portfolio. So just in short, there are different ways that you may not fit that investor. So you have to get quite used to accepting that, you know, maybe the match isn't a good one and just moving on and uh, finding somebody uh, new to interact with. So you just become very adept at building that network and um, interacting with people and just talking to them. So that's that's how I would say um, I went around, um, you know, raising money and building that network of contacts that I could call upon. 
And, and uh, Claire, can you tell me a bit about uh, BioCity's involvement with Canonica? Why did you choose to invest in the company? Yeah, so I first met Canonica in 2019 now when we were um, part of something called the Innovate UK Precision Medicine Accelerator. And so that was a an initiative that the government had helped to develop and um, Canomica had applied to for some of the funding affiliated with that and it had to be matched with investors. So when I first met the team, I thought, oh, I think there's something really interesting here. And it was you know, a combination of the, the science and just the kind of vision of what the company wanted to do. And, and they, they have this phosphoproteomics platform and they were really starting to work out where exactly they should position this technology. And, you know, they had some early data that had shown that you could help stratify patients and see a difference in patients if you stratify them according to their phosphoproteomics signature. And so with that in mind, you know, increasingly we'd started to see that genomics is not the whole story when it comes to how patients get the right drug and what a patient's tumour looks like to, to guide them towards a particular therapy. And so fossil proteomics was a very much an emerging area for this sector. And so, you know, there was a tick box from the science that I thought, OK, this is maybe going somewhere. And um, I, I worked with the team, uh, started to, to, to bring in Jane at this point. She had a lot of experience in the um, diagnostic space. And start to say, well, how could we leverage this technology in the right way for maximum value? And, and really that sort of led, I guess, to the strategy they've got today. And it is around how you can take the technology and use it to, yes, OK, you can help stratify patients um, that maybe come to a, a doctor and, and um, a an oncologist who wants to think about the right therapy, but actually some of the, the best value is how you can use it to stratify patients and drugs that are still being developed, that are still in the pipeline, and giving insights to the pharma and how the, the fossil proteomics is going to help you better choose those patients for the right drug. And so that's really where the kind of business evolution has settled on now and what underpinned the, the investment. So I think for me it was around a technology at the precipice of the right time it had come along long when when we needed this next stage and you'd started to incorporate you know the omics era and um so canomica really ticked a lot of boxes there and uh, and i just felt it was something that we needed to be part of so so we helped put the business together you know introduced jane to the founders the academic founders pedro and david um, were just, you know, really hit it off. And it just was really a match made in, in heaven in many ways. <laughs> and um, and that's resulted in, in things working out really well and accumulating in the, the kind of Series A investment that we got in December. And Jane, what, what will um, this latest funding, both from, from BioCity and, and others, what will, it, what will it mean for the company? Oh, this investment is such a big deal for Kinomica. Uh, it really means that we can grow the company to keep up with the demand for our K-Scan platform service and really move our technology closer to the bedside in, in translational medicine and towards companion diagnostics. Um, it means that we can take on new laboratory space, new office space, hire the wonderful rock star staff that we need to reach our goals. Uh, and it means we can maximise the opportunities that are now becoming very apparent from our ongoing acute myeloid leukaemia clinical trial, where we, we actually used K-Scan to predict response to a drug called Midastorin. And the initial data from that trial is absolutely fantastic and really bears out what we saw uh, when we were looking at the preclinical data and that data that we had presented way back in 2019 to Claire. Um, so as a company, we have some really amazing plans about how to take our technology forward to benefit patients. And really, that's always been at the core of what Canomic is all about. And it really, you know, makes our team the engaged and passionate team that we are because we're wanting to bring that technology uh, to benefit patients. Um, so the, the investment is huge for Canomica and it's going to be huge for um, patients as well. That sounds like it's great news. And Jane and Claire, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. 
My next guest on this episode of the podcast is Lisa Anson from RedX. Lisa, welcome. Thanks, and it's great to be here. So I wanted to start off by looking at what whether you think that currently Big Pharma looks to the biotech sector to serve really as its drug discovery engine. Yeah, I think it's an interesting topic. And uh, in many ways, you're absolutely right. It's uh, biotech has increasingly become um, the engine of uh, of research for the whole sector. I mean, if you if you take a look at some of the numbers, they tell a story. If you look at the number of um, FDA approved drugs in the last um, three years, uh, more than 60 percent of them have been originated in uh, small companies. So originated in the sense of a small company took it into clinic. And then at some point, they've uh, oftentimes moved into large pharma by the time they get approval. Um, but I think that's quite astonishing that uh, two thirds of the industry's approved pipeline in the last three years has come from small biotech compared to uh, maybe around a third 10 years ago. So you can see the trends. And, and I think it just shows how there's been an explosion of research in many small companies, my own company included, Red X Pharma, um, and uh, uh, many others around the world in terms of their success in early stage discovery research and early clinical. And as you, as you mentioned, the trends looking at uh, historic figures certainly seem to be clear. Do, do you think th this sort of trend will, will continue? Yeah, I, I think um, oftentimes there's um, real agility in a smaller company, um, and that sometimes that's traded with capabilities where you do need to be slightly larger. So uh, with certain technology, whereas where there is a, some sort of scale economy. But what we have definitely seen is that the large farmer, and I worked at AstraZeneca for many years, and um, it was certainly true there, it's true most large farmer, they want to get the best pipeline and the best programs. And it doesn't really matter whether that's been internally developed or sourced in. So if you, you know, many people in the sector talk now about kind of search strategies rather than research strategies in the sense that they just want to get the best programs and the best pipeline wherever they've come from. And I think that kind of agnostic element or indifferent, if you want to say that way, element to the sourcing of a program opens up a lot more opportunities um, in terms of bringing in licensing versus um, sourcing it internally. So I think it, the trend will continue. I think um, that no one exactly knows who's going to be able to develop the best drug at any one time, um, because this is, you know, this is science and it is discovery. And so, uh, you know, people are prepared to take risk in small companies now, and I don't expect that to, to, to stop. And in terms of that that sourcing, that that searching that you mentioned, um, what do you think big pharma companies typically look look for when it comes to uh, licensing deals? Yeah, well, they, um, I think, you know, quite often there's targets that that pharma companies have to grow in a therapy area or grow in a certain pathway or build on a strength that they have in a commercial perspective, and they want to continue a franchise. So. Um, every pharma company will have their own strategy and they will be looking for assets and new drugs within that um, strategic framework. So that's the first thing you have to understand with is, is which companies are looking in which areas. So a big pharma company will be looking um, for a number of things in their programs. Obviously, they'll want to have a target that uh, makes sense to them biologically and, as I've just mentioned, strategically. So something um, that uh, they believe will translate into efficacy into a drug. They obviously want to have a certain level of safety information preclinically that can translate into the clinic. That's really important. Um, I think one of the areas that Redex in particular have been really good at is um, developing molecules that have good drug-like properties, so good pharmacokinetics, um, good ability to uh, be assured that you're getting the right exposure at the tissue, so you actually get the drug into the part of the body that you want it to be. Um, I think increasingly you see a, a selection of the right patients. So making sure you have some sort of patient selection strategy. So identifying which patients are going to be most likely to respond to the drug. And obviously a potential for some uh, commercial return, be that a size of the pa patient population or degree of efficacy. So, you know, in an ideal world, you'd have all of those things that you could um, say this is actually really likely to be a drug. And I think uh, quite often um, as smaller companies don't do all of the battery of tests um, that a larger company might do. They're, I've mentioned they're quite agile, but if you can show enough on all of those to give 
someone confidence that this is likely to become a drug, then I think you have a very viable uh, proposition to take forward into a big pharma licensing deal. Or indeed, um, increasingly many biotechs are actually then investing to take forward those molecules themselves. And your your own company, uh, Redex, has been quite uh, quite active of late. Uh, most recently, signing uh, a very interesting sounding deal with AstraZeneca. Can you tell me a bit about that deal and, and what you think it will bring to the company? Yeah, I think we have um, a really great portfolio of preclinical assets in Redex. Um, obviously, uh, people may be familiar with a, a compound we licensed a couple of years back, uh, the Loxo 305 compound, as it's now known with Lilly. And um, that's doing really well with Lily. It's finished phase phase two. And so um, that was an original licensing deal. We had a couple of additional assets that we've we've licensed. Um, we've we've talked to Jazz with our PANRAF program. And we also talked to AstraZeneca, as you mentioned, with our um, porcupine inhibition program last year. And we've kept a couple of assets that we've decided to develop in-house, which we're very excited about. So, you know, from that that range of portfolio of assets that we've developed, we had a number that we wanted to partner and we had a number we wanted to keep in house. And the, the deal that we did with AstraZeneca was very important to us because um, it's it's a uh, porcupine inhibitor. We already have a porcupine inhibitor program um, that we're developing for oncology, but we felt there was real potential for porcupine inhibition in fibrosis as well. Um, so we wanted to have uh, a program for that, which we de developed, which is known as um, RxC006. And AstraZeneca were very interested in the area of fibrosis, particularly um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is lung, lung fibrosis, a really nasty, debilitating disease with a very poor mortality rate, very few treatments. So an area of, of high unmet need. Um, so there's interest in developing treatments there. And uh, we were aware of AstraZeneca's interest in this disease, and we felt that we had a molecule that could be taken forward there, and we didn't have the um, scale and resources to be able to take forward uh, in addition to our own at that time. So we felt it was a good opportunity to license, keep, it, keep some uh, milestones and royalties from that program, but allow AstraZeneca to take it forward. Um, and they were very interested in the molecule, and we, we managed to do a licensing deal with them uh, last July, so in July of 2020, and that program is now fully handed over to AstraZeneca, and they are running that with the hope of getting it into the clinic uh, by the end of this year or early next year, we, we expect. And Lisa, Reddit obviously had a, a strong year uh, last year. What, what were the highlights of 2020 for you? Yeah, thanks. Really strong year for Reddit. Um, Gained some real momentum. I think the key for us was um, securing an investment. I think uh, oftentimes the challenge with biotech is really securing sufficient investment. So we got some fantastic specialist investors, uh, Red Mile, Sofanova and, and Polar Capital, investing in our company and believing in our portfolio. At the same time, we managed to do a couple of important business development deals uh, with AstraZeneca and also with Jazz. And the combination of those two has meant that we have um, exited uh, last year on a very strong financial footing and that gives us real confidence in, in taking the company forward so yes a really good year for the company it certainly sounds like it's um, exciting times at uh, red eggs but lisa thank you very much for joining me on the podcast thank you To conclude this episode's look at accessing funding and investment within the UK life science ecosystem, I'm pleased to welcome back to the podcast Dr. Kath McKay. Kath, can you tell me a bit about what support Alderley Park is able to give to start-up and scale-up companies? Of course, yeah. I mean, we are very much actively um, providing support to the, the companies um, in, in Alderley Park and, and the wider network. Um, so as, a, as someone who, who operates a, a life science and innovation campus, it's not just a pure play. Um, we have access to top of the range scientific facilities and laboratories. Um, we've invested in a science service division where we have a number of, of, of shared open access functions um, that, that businesses can, can access to support their um, innovations. We've got um, an open access laboratory um, with pay and play analytical equipment. Um, we've got um, a, a vivarium 
um, and we've got a number of other shared services that allow companies to, to land at Oldley Park without having to make huge capital and, and people investments. We've got um, also we fund um, an accelerator program which provides many kind of business connections for our companies which about um, uh, triply, but really that, that accelerator function provides um, innovation and, and business support to, to start up and scale up companies through a structured um, accelerator um, and, and boot camp program, but also through some softer one-to-one -one connections for, for businesses to, to be able to establish themselves, but also to scale up. Um, and I would say in terms of um, wider support, Oldley Park is part of SciTech, which is the largest UK operator of, of life science and um, innovation campuses and sites. And being part of Oldley Park, acts, it allows companies to access that, that wider support and wider network that, that Bromwood SciTech brings. And I think something very interesting about SciTech and Oldley Park is um, we're not just a space provider and a real estate company, but we, we really get under the bonnet of the, the challenges and opportunities that, that each of the companies in the portfolio has. And you know, we're able to provide linkages and connections and targeted growth and innovation support to the businesses in the network. And in terms of that wider network that you mentioned, um, can you tell me a bit about how Alderley Park is able to help create connections? Absolutely. I think some of it um, actually you know, it does come down to facilities and real estate. And the way, you know, the way we design the buildings, it, it, we have connectivity in mind. So we design a lot of our spaces, our shared spaces, where people can um, you know, grab a coffee and also you know, at the same time bump into um, other companies and you know, other executives and, and, and you know, we design the right spaces to foster a spirit of, of collaboration. Um, we have also designed an events program that brings people together to, to foster a spirit of collaboration. And actually in COVID, much of that has gone online. So we've been really working out the best ways to, to bring people together and develop and maintain that cultural aspect, despite not being able to, to hold physical events. So I think that there's, um, there's an events program. There's also something around the design of our physical spaces. But it's also in, in, in terms of the, the, the business network that we've generated on the campus, um, that provides connections for many of the companies and organizations on site. Um, through our colleagues at BioCity, we run something called the Oldley Park Accelerator. Um, and through the Accelerator, we offer an expert mentor network. So we've got access to around 200 professionals who are able to act as that critical friend to the very businesses on site. Um, we've got experts in that network um, in areas such as um, commercial development, relation science, manufacturing, um, human resources, any aspect of, of running a business, there is representation on that expert mentor network and, and businesses have the opportunity um, to access that network of individuals through, through us and, and those individual, individuals want to give something back to the community pro bono and support the, the younger organisations, the smaller organisations that we, we have on site. Through our collaborations, um, we can offer connections. I'm, I'm thinking of some examples such as um, NHS. So we are um, partnering with, the, with NHS and local academic health science networks in Manchester region, but also um, in, in Liverpool city region. Um, and we can offer I suppose, access to some of those collaborations, some of those people through those well-developed um, relationships that we, we have. And I think that's something about being part of um, the, the Broadway SciTech network and, and being part of Oldley Park is you have access to a lot of those stakeholder relationships that, that we have. And, and our role is to really proactively go around making those linkages and connections for our businesses to thrive. and. With the NHS example in mind, many of the companies in the portfolio might want to think about um, designing a particular diagnostic device and, and thinking about how to get it tested in people. And that's where the NHS connections um, and access to the NHS can really be very valuable in terms of um, you know, what's needed from a user perspective and what's needed from a buyer perspective. So I think we, we're really actively looking to foster uh, connections and collaborations um, across the company base. Um, and I think one thing we've done as well is we've started to bring together a peer-to-peer -to -peer network of the company executives and chief execs. And 
while we've laid the foundations for that, um, that's starting to mature now, and that network of of, um, of executive peers is really starting to to come together, which is quite nice to see. I think we've got great leadership across the companies at Albany Park, and um, there are many informal collaborations and informal networks that are starting to to mature across the campus, which actually you know, we're not really involved in proactively, but it's a, it's, a, it's a marker of maturity of the site to see that a lot of this is, is starting to happen around us, which is quite interesting. So it certainly sounds like Alderley Park has a great set of, set of facilities and also a really comprehensive network that companies can tap into. But Kath, for now, thank you very much for joining me on this episode of the podcast. Thank you. You've been listening to the Alderley Park Discovery Podcast. For all episodes and more information, visit alderleypark.co.uk forward slash listen. Please leave us a rating and a review and subscribe within your podcast app so you know when new episodes are released. Thank you.